Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, everyone. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible relationship educator and author, Patty Howell. Hello, Patty, and welcome to the show. Well, hello, and thank you very much, Zach. I'm happy to be here. Today, we are going to talk about creating conditions for growth. But before we get into that, let's learn about our illustrious guest. For those that don't know, Patty Howell is the president of Healthy Relationships California, a nonprofit organization that has taught relationship skills and psychosocial education programs to more than 200,000 participants throughout California and beyond. For years, Patty has taught a broad range of relationship and psychosocial education programs to diverse populations throughout the U.S. and in 14 countries around the world. She and her late husband, Ralph Jones, are the co-authors of World Class Marriage, How to Create the Relationship You Always Wanted with the Partner You Already Have, and the creators of the World Class Family of Relationship Skills and Curricula Taught to More Than 100,000 People. Hello, Patty. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy you're here, too, because I have so many questions. I was so happy when I came across your nonprofit, Healthy Relationships California, because part of the idea behind this podcast was simply recognizing that love is a skill and we can all get better at it through learning and practice. So I'm curious, how did Healthy Relationships California come about? Well, it started in 2005 when two people in California came together. One was the head of a Sacramento Healthy Marriage Project in the northern part of the state, and then the other was the head of the Orange County Marriage Resource Center in the southern part of the state, and they hatched the idea of uh, putting together a coalition among organizations such as theirs and creating one cohesive coalition, which uh, had a different name when it started. It was called California Healthy Marriages Coalition. And they organized a meeting among other marriage educators in the, in California, and I attended that, and meanwhile had been tapped by the Orange County guy to work with him in writing a grant application to the federal government for uh, funding. And the week that the organization applied um, in Sacramento for the nonprofit charter was the week we submitted the grant application. And on the basis of the app that we submitted, we were awarded $583,000, which is a hefty chunk of money for any new nonprofit to use to get itself going. So it really... Yeah, that's great. I know. It gave us a great opportunity to start in a strong way and not just limp along with, you know, three bucks or something. So at the end of that 18 months, we had put together a coalition of organizations around the state, and we were off and running. So you started in 2005, so you've been doing this for a while. And before we get into the concepts that you teach, I'm curious, where do you get your curricula from? Like, you're not a research institute, for example, so where do you get the knowledge and wisdom and information from? Well, we started with the well-known, best-known programs around the country that we were familiar with and taught in the first year or so about 15 different curricula, including world-class marriage that my husband Ralph and I had developed. And we did outcome research on all of the different programs that we were offering. And Interestingly, some of them were kind of positive, one or two were negative, and the strongest one of all was world-class marriage. So that put me in the driver's seat of um, being the curriculum developer for the organization. I didn't really know I had that much talent in that department, but when our outcomes were so strong... We started to build on that, and from world-class marriage, we developed world-class relationships for work and home and raising world-class kids and, you know, lots of other spin-off programs. So it just came about as a result of having such good outcome data and my being happy to write programs, and I've ended up now writing quite a few more than that. 
Wow. So World Class Marriage has been really successful in helping couples stay together. So let's go right into some of the concepts that you teach. What are some basic ideas that we can bring into our marriage to make it world class? Well, we've identified 16 pillars of a world-class marriage, and uh, they were based on two sets of research data that have been accumulated over the years because we wanted it to be grounded in science. It couldn't just be what Ralph and Patty thought was a good idea, you know. You see a lot of programs <laughs> developed by Pastor Bob or whoever it is, you know. Right. A lot of advice columns out there. Yeah, you ought to be nice to each other or whatever, whatever. And we wanted to have more. <laughs> it ought, we wanted to have more teeth than that, more more grounding in in data. So, the data we looked at came first of all from the work of Carl Rogers, who was active 50 years ago. But his work was so powerful because it identified the three conditions for growth. And I'll tell you more about that later. But there's just been 50 years of research on the three conditions for growth. And then the other body of data was from John Gottman, um, a researcher at the University of Washington. And he identified the characteristics of a relationship that breaks up. You know, he, he did, he collected so much data that he was able to spot really quite quickly the behaviors that would correlate with divorce and the behaviors that would correlate with marital success. So we popped together those two fields of research into what we identified Mm. as 16 pillars, Mm. and that's what we teach in World Class Marriage. All right. I love those two people you mentioned. Carl Rogers, I love his work, and John Gottman has come up many times on the show. So we have 16 pillars, and we probably don't have time to talk about all of them. So let's just talk about what are some of the pillars that you find yourself returning to most often in your own work? All right. Well, for me personally, it's avoiding blame. (laughs) That's Mm. one of them. (laughs) I somehow or other got blamed a lot as a kid in, you know, in the garden variety way that parents and teachers do. You know, like, no, Patty, that's wrong. You don't be so selfish or, you know, whatever the things are that they say to you. So. I learned to be very blameful, and it's a Mm. very corrosive behavior. You really need to root it out of your relationship. I mean, nobody likes to be blamed. We all got a lot of that growing up, and any time I blame you today or you blame me today, Zach, it kind of reverberates with all that old stuff from, from 20, 40, 50, whatever years ago. It's really damaging to relationships. So that's my my personal um, big one. Then listening is terribly important. We call it power listening because people don't quite believe it's the most powerful thing you can do to help somebody who's got a problem. And your partner always has problems. I mean, you know, they're upset about something that happened or they've got a life decision they have to deal with. Other people always have lots of problems. So what can you do that's really helpful when they're dealing with the problem? Well, it's it's called power listening. And it's, uh, you know, showing that you have empathy and that's a skill, you know, that you need to learn. So that's a biggie uh, that we, you know, really need to use regularly. Number three, I would say, is giving apology and forgiveness. You're always going to mess up, you know, no matter how good your intentions are. But we all screw up from time to time. You know, you step on each other's toes one way or another. And so you need to be able to apologize. You need to, need to be able to be clean about it, not try to justify your behavior by saying, well, it wasn't my fault that I did this because da-da-da-da-da. You have to be able to cop to it and say, you know, I blew it, and I really feel bad about that, and I'm very sorry I hurt you. Mm-hmm. And you need to be able to forgive. That's the flip side of it when your partner apologizes to you. You know, you have to open your heart and be able to hear their regret, and it's hard for people to apologize. It certainly was a tough skill for me to learn. But, you know, when people do it, they don't always do it in an A-plus way. So you have to listen for their intent and get it that there's a person and they're trying to say to you that they feel bad and open Mm. your heart to that and be able to forgive them. And that is what will help you both move on. It's always generally small stuff, little hurt feelings about this and that. I mean, sometimes there were big things, but a lot of the time it's it's garden variety, day-to-day stuff, and it's important that you be able to move on past that. And then number four is being able to resolve conflicts. 
because you will have conflicts together. Every relationship has conflicts. It is not whether you have conflict. It's how you deal with it. And if you think you don't have conflict, uh, you're, you're fooling yourself. Every relationship has conflicts, little or, or large. Mm. And um, you need to be able to resolve your conflicts in a way that you both get your needs met. I mean, if I get my needs met, Zach, and you lose, you're going to be resentful of me. And if you get your needs met and I lose, I'm going to be resentful of you. Either way, there's relationship damage. And you can't afford relationship damage. So you both get your needs met. So, again, that's a skill. You have to learn how to do it. It isn't that tough to learn. But you have to get skilled at it because when you have a conflict, your emotions run high. We all lost a lot of the time as kids. And so when I'm in a conflict with my partner right now, I tend to think I'm going to lose. I've got that old junk from the past that pops up. And we're afraid we're going to lose. And so we come on strong or or we cave. So those are four big ones. They're, you know, they're very, very important skills to learn. Those are some really great pillars that you just mentioned. I heard one, avoiding blame. So take out the judgment, take out the criticism, take out the blaming of your partner. Two, empathic listening, or what you might call power listening. So being able to receive our partner with our heart. Three, giving apology and forgiveness. And four, being able to resolve conflicts. All those are already pretty powerful. Another pillar I found interesting when I was reading your book on world-class marriages is avoiding what you call cool talk. And I was wondering if you give our listeners some examples of cool talk and why we should avoid it. Whatever. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you caught that. That's a common one. People say that all the day. Whatever. And, you know, it's, it's just a kind of a sassy way of saying all kinds of stuff and not owning up to whatever it is you feel, you know? Uh, or saying something like, well, ain't that nice, you know? Hmm. Um, they make you sound cool, you know? It's And it's common stuff, and it's the kind of stuff that you see on television, you know, going on between two characters in a sitcom, especially the person in the show who's going for the laughs. You know, you hear a lot of cool talk at those times and so it's modeled in our culture there are a couple problems with cool talk one is it's you the other person get their feelings hurt quite easily you aren't communicating clearly what you think or feel so it opens the door to ambiguity and and confusion you know you what are they saying is they like it or they don't like it or are they mad at me i mean there's this all this kind of confusion going on and ultimately what's so unattractive about cool talk is in your big relationship in life with your partner with the person you love with the person you're trying to make a life with you don't want coolness you want warmth Mm. so it really is important to get beyond the cool talk and look within yourself and figure out what am I trying to say here you know am I trying to say I'm I don't like what you did or I'm hurt or I'm frustrated, or I feel rejected, or look at what's really going on and have the guts to communicate about that. Communicating about what's really going on can be a lot more scary than cool talk, but Mm -hmm. it's not a way to build closeness and understanding, and that's what you really are going for in your primary relationship. Yeah, it sounds a little sarcastic and also a little dismissive. Yes. I love that. So you don't want to be cool. You want to be warm in your relationships. So I'd love to move into creating conditions for growth. But before we do that, I kind of want to ask about why we should grow in relationships in the first place. And the reason I ask, because I'm sure many people would love to have just a very nice, easygoing relationship. That's just a very nice source of happiness. They come home, things are pleasant and good all the time. You know, not many people want to go home after a long day of work and then do some deeply emotionally challenging things. So my first question is, why is growth so necessary in our relationships? Well, I get why it'd be nice to come home and just have a pleasant time. Absolutely. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And and growth sounds, you know, annoying at that point when you're tired at the end of the day. But here's the deal. Who you were when you were 20 or whatever age it was, when you were cute and all of that, and you met your partner and you fell in love, that's not enough 
to be able to handle all the challenges of life. Because what comes along is illness, losing jobs, death in the family, I mean, raising kids. I mean, life is tough. I mean, look at right now with the coronavirus pandemic. You know, there are challenges in life. And just being cute isn't enough. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. It's bad news. <laughs> and a lot of people ride the cuteness for years, you know. And it's lovely when you've got that going for you. But life does have a way of coming along. And the more capable you are, the more you've learned, the more you've grown uh, emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, the more capable you are of handling the challenges of life. And life is pretty darn challenging. And relationships are challenging. So I want my partner to grow. Because I want to be with somebody who's really capable of solving problems. And likewise, he wants me to grow. Because he doesn't want to just have a cute whatever who can't handle things well. We both are looking for somebody who can pull their own weight and makes contributions to our lives. You know? Uh, the more capable my partner is, the more capable I am, the better functioning we are together as a couple mm. and the more we can achieve and the easier our life is, the, you know, the easier we ride the, the bumpy waves of life. And that's why we all need to be looking at growth. And the easiest way to create growth is within a supportive relationship. I mean, with a partner that gives you the space to grow and provides the conditions that foster growth. And uh, it makes sense for you to be able to provide those conditions for your partner as well so he or she can grow. I just love that sentiment. Life is hard, and the more capable we are, the more we've grown, the more capable we are in handling the challenges of life. And I also believe that firmly that relationships and intimate relationships are one of the most beautiful containers for healing and growth. So looking into creating those conditions for promoting growth in a relationship, you write about three conditions. So what are those conditions? They are empathy, acceptance, and genuineness. And those are the three conditions that were found um, from the research uh, from Carl Rogers' work that I mentioned earlier. And what's interesting is that grew out of looking at therapist interactions with their clients. And as you know, there are all different kinds of therapists, that, you know, lots of different theoretical approaches. You go to that grad school, you learn how to do X kind of therapy. Somebody else goes to another grad school, they learn Y, you know, Z, and so on. So the researchers looked at what are the characteristics of the therapist whose clients had the most successful outcomes in terms of their having grown in their capacity to solve their problems. And they found that it was not a particular psychological theory or discipline or a kind of an approach to therapy, but it was these three characteristics of the therapist that created the most positive outcome in their clients. Empathy, acceptance, and genuineness. So regardless of my theoretical orientation, if I provided those three skills, my clients had a good chance of being able to grow successfully in dealing with their problems. So they became known as the three conditions that are necessary and sufficient for growth. So I looked at those characteristics and I thought, boy, we got to teach people how to pump those characteristics into their personal relationship because, you know, of the importance of growth. So empathy is probably the one most people are most familiar with, which is the capacity to to get what it's like in the other person's shoes. My being able to understand from what you say and your body language and your nonverbals and so on, what's going on with you right now? And if I can demonstrate that I get that, that means I'm showing empathy. Acceptance is accepting what's going on in you, not needing you to change, you know, not saying things to you like, Zach, don't feel that way or... No, no, don't mm. cry or come on, get over it. You know, instead it's just letting you be the way you are. You are upset like this right now about that and my being okay with that and giving you the space to have the feelings you have right now, not needing you to change. And then genuineness is being authentic, having my things I say and what I do and the look on my face 
really match what's going on in me. So that if I'm upset with you, I tell you that. I don't try to pretend I'm fine. Oh, no, it's fine. None of that phony stuff. Because phoniness smells. So you have to be authentic and say, I'm I'm sad about this, or I'm hurt, or I'm confused, or I'm angry, or whatever. So empathy, acceptance, and genuineness. The three conditions. If you can keep those three conditions pumping at all times in your relationship, it fosters growth and it makes it safe for your partner to be who they are, which makes it easy for your partner to explore what it would take to grow. And if your partner provides that to you, likewise, you're in a safe place where you can grow. It sounds very much like Carl Rogers' idea of unconditional positive regard. Yep, yep, yep. That was what he originally called it. And that's Mm. the acceptance part of it, for sure. And being oriented to in a truly accepting way, uh, regardless of what's going on in the other person. It's beautiful stuff. Yeah, it is really beautiful stuff. I really just love those intentions, right? To create more empathy, create more acceptance, create more genuineness, and working on cultivating these qualities And I'm wondering what might be like some concrete actions a couple or a person in a couple can do in in order to bring these qualities more into the relationship. So once you've set the intention, all right, I want to be more empathic, more accepting and more genuine with my partnership. What's the next step? Well, you can't just say, I'm um, I'm being empathic toward you right now, Zach. You (laughs) You can't just open up your insides and show empathy you have to be able to demonstrate it in some words or actions and so um, that's the listening skill that we call power listening it's also called empathic listening active listening you know there are different terms for it I don't care what you call it the deal is I need to be able to reflect back to you my understanding of your thoughts and feelings putting that into my own words So, you know, I just hear what's going on and I say, gee, sounds like you're whatever, 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 summarizing the thoughts a little bit, but absolutely um, really latching on to the feeling you're feeling and doing that accurately, not exaggerating it or not underplaying it, but getting what's really like over there with you right now. And if I can feed that back to you, the magic is that when you experience something, it loses its grip. So if you're upset right now, Zach, and I, I you know, I listen to you a bit, and I say, it sounds like you're really ticked off about this. It's really bugging you. If I'm at all close on that, you'll say, yes. You kind of breathe a little bit at that point, and maybe you talk a little more about it. And then very shortly after that, it starts to lose its grip on you because you're not resisting it. You're experiencing the feeling. And when you can experience your feelings, they dissipate. Feelings are transitory. They come and they go unless they're blocked. So when power listening lets the other person experience their feelings. And the magic of that is that when your feelings have dissipated, your brains open up again and you have more intellectual capacity to problem solve. When you're feeling upset, your brains aren't working so well. You're, you know, you're angry or you're storming around, whatever. You're not open to problem solving at that point. But once somebody gives you the opportunity to vent and experience the feelings, they go away and your, your brains kind of come back. It really makes it much easier to problem solve at that point. That's one thing you can do. That's the power of listening. Yeah, I love everything that you're saying. It really sounds like just really beautiful advice. Even just that sort of sentence prop sounds like, you know, so someone shares something with you and you say something like, it sounds like this is what it is that you're feeling. And I sort of have in mind a very stereotypical impasse that many couples experience where one partner, let's say partner A, has no idea what they did or what's going on. And then partner B refuses to talk about it. So partner A is like, something wrong, honey? You seem bothered. And partner B is like, no, no, nothing's nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. It's fine. It's fine. Just, you know, it's just funny that or something like that. And how to kind of break out of this impasse? Because 
here we have maybe somebody who wants to be empathic, but they have no clue <laughs> what's going on with their partner. Sounds like you're mad. No, I'm not mad. And then we have the other one who's simply not being honest about what it is that they're experiencing, but they might not even know necessarily what specific emotions that they are feeling, but they are sort of putting up this wall. So if we have this intention for empathy, acceptance, genuineness, how do we break through the wall that many couples experience when one doesn't know what the other one is experiencing and the other one, for whatever reason, is not fully able to communicate it? Yeah. So one thing you can feed back is what they are clearly telling you is, boy, is whatever it might be, you really don't want to talk about it. And have that, have empathy about that. You can imagine what it's like over there with the person. It's nothing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can get what that's feeling like. Like, you know, out of my space, fella, I don't want to talk about that. So, you know, you see that back, like, play, you know, whatever it is, you don't want me to pry about that. You want to just be by yourself with it and try to be empathic about that. And maybe they'll say, yeah, I mean, you know, because last time I talked to you, you were horrible about it. Or whatever, they might t- they might give you a little more. Saying, all right, so you had a bad experience with me last time, and it made you pretty leery. You always give me advice, and I can't stand your darn advice. Boy, that's an important thing for you. When I give you advice, it ticks you off. I mean, you know, there's stuff there. If you're willing to hear it, if you're willing to hear it, and feed it back with empathy, with caring, with acceptance. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you are in the mood to talk right now. So when would be a good time? Something like that. I would even leave off that last sentence. <laughs> you know, that's your agenda. Mm-hmm. His, his agenda, her agenda is, yeah, I'm not in the mood to talk right now. You might, if, if you, so you feed it back and say, what? Well, sounds like you really don't want to talk. Then you could, at that point, be authentic and say, gee, I'm kind of disappointed. I would love to be able to talk with you about whatever it is that's going on. That's your mm. feeling. That, but you could say authentically. Not push it, just say it. Just, there's a, pa- a chapter in our book that I particularly like. It, it's called Getting Men to Communicate. And it's it's really based on a somewhat unfair stereotype that men are uh, more reluctant to communicate than women. But, boy... It's also very true of women sometimes. But anyway, getting men to communicate is about the how do you deal with somebody who really doesn't want to be talking about his or her feelings. You know, they're, they've had uncomfortable situations probably in the past when it didn't go over well and they were made to feel uncomfortable. And how do you deal with that? You have to be able to provide empathy about that. You're not... This is not a crowbar situation where you should be trying to pry them open. It's about empathy and getting it. Boy, Bob, whatever the name is, you know, you really don't want to be talking about this right now. It doesn't appeal to you at all. Hmm. And at least Bob will say, yeah, you're right. I really don't want to. And you can say, all right, I get it. You're pretty firm about that. Yeah, hearing you mention this word authenticity and describing one's own emotions, I do feel that it's a bit contagious. Like when you are in conflict with your partner and it's easy to attack, blame the other one. But once you open up about your own feelings, you can say, well, you know, I'm just a little scared that, you know, we might be breaking up. And then that vulnerability brings vulnerability out of your partner, too. And they say, well, I'm just frustrated that, you know, such and such happened. Yep, 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 yep. I mean, that's, that does make a big difference. It is contagious. And it's it's hard to do that, but then that helps you get it that it might be hard for your partner to do that, too. I mean, these, these things are not easy to talk about. It, it is easier to be talking about what happened today, yada, yada, yada. But the feelings thing, the vulnerability involved in that is, is scary for people, especially early on in the relationship. I was with Ralph for 40 years before he died, and it took him a lot of years to get comfortable in sharing some feelings with me. It just took him a lot of years to learn that it was safe. It doesn't happen in three months or three years. It took probably a decade. The interesting thing about power listening is you don't have to be 
on the bullseye in being able to reflect the other person's thoughts and feelings. If you're just near the target at all, it'll be good enough because it's so much better than giving advice or, you know, push, pushing them around or criticizing or the usual stuff that people do. If you're in the ballpark, they'll say, no, it isn't so much that I'm angry. It's more like I'm confused or upset or whatever. They'll clarify and they'll go on because you're making it safe for them to be able to go on. It's really incredible to hear that it basically took your husband almost a decade to really begin to feel safe talking about his feelings. And that ties into something I was wondering about how to sort of approach growth in our relationship. Because yes, relationships are wonderful containers for growth. And here we are creating conditions for growth. But we want to simultaneously accept our partner for just who they are in the moment. So how do we reconcile accepting the other person and accepting ourselves while also trying to grow, trying to improve? Right. Well, Ralph's growth was Ralph's business, okay? And my growth is Mm. my business. So I try to create the conditions for my partner to grow, but his deciding to grow and being able to grow is up to him. It isn't Mm. something I can make happen. Yeah, like it's like a attending to a plant, right? You you water the soil, you put it in the sun, and you want it to grow, and it grows on its own time. Exactly. Like my tomatoes this summer didn't want to do a good job. That's, that's all there was to it. <laughs> I did my best, but it was up to them, and they didn't, they didn't grow particularly well. And that's the way it is in relationships. The other person's in charge of their own growth. But you can provide the the water and the fertilizer. Absolutely. I mean, and you know, imagine somebody's in a relationship with you and you love them, and you're being accepting and genuine and empathic. I mean, oh, that's beautiful stuff. That's beautiful stuff. And it may take you a while to realize you're safe and be willing to open up and share more vulnerably and take on some big challenges. People warm to that. They absolutely warm to it. That leads into my next question, because I did want to ask you what the key is to effective confrontation with our partner. Because I really love these qualities that you're describing, empathy, acceptance, genuineness. It really just brings a warmth and love to the relationship that we so seek. But there come sometimes in our relationship where we encounter deeply ingrained issues that need to be kind of dealt with in the moment. And it's important to, of course, deal with these problems in the moment rather than let them build resentment and sweep them under the rug. So what is the best way to kind of approach our partner trying to root out an issue while also expressing these qualities? So you want to be genuine. It isn't uh, going to do it if I am genuinely outraged and blameful and shredding your character. That's not going to work. You know, it's, it's going to cause resistance. You're going to want to shut me up, right? <laughs> so what you want to have happen when you confront your partner or anybody is you, you want them to be open to changing their behavior because they care about your needs. You don't want to be engendering a ton of resistance. You want them to be open to caring about your needs and to listening to your thoughts and feelings, right? So the key to it is to be non-blameful, and it's darn tough to do sometimes. But it just creates resistance, and what you want to have happen is you want behavior change. You don't want resistance. If you have resistance, you're going to have to listen to all of that and get it all settled down, and they're going to be very reluctant to change. But if you can be non-blameful and help them see that whatever it is they're doing is a problem for you, it's upsetting for you in some kind of way, but they're not a horrible person because they've done that. They're going to be much much more open to initiating behavior change because they care about your needs. Hmm. I think a lot of times in relationships we talk about red flags, and this to me is like one of those wonderful green flags is that when your partner is open to changing their behavior because they care about you. Yes, it's heavenly. It just feels like the best thing. It really does. And... Let's just tackle, we're running low on time, so, but I do want to finish this kind of blame and this task of rooting blame out of our relationships. 
by using another like very stereotypical example, we, me and my partner were joking that, you know what, it all comes down to the dishes. And so let's say like partner A asks, asks their partner to wash the dishes and the next day the dishes aren't washed. Now this seems to be like a very easy situation to blame them. Well, they were supposed to do something and they didn't do something. So therefore it's 100% their fault, right? So how do we approach, you know, such a simple thing that seems like it's one person's fault entirely? How do we get around not blaming them? Exactly. So you want to start with a non-blameful description of the behavior. When you say you're going to do the dishes and I noticed this morning they aren't done, right? That's the description of the behavior. There's no blame in it. And it helps to start with the word when. When you say you'll do the dishes and I notice they aren't done. Then the second part is you want to talk about the impact of it on you. And that might be, you know, I find it hard to be able to make my breakfast because there's not much room in the kitchen or whatever it is, you know. And that needs to be realistic, the concrete and tangible effect of the behavior on you. And then the third part is your feeling, and that needs to be genuine. can't be made up. can't be too strong for you know, how you're really feeling, or too wimpy. It needs to be accurate, how you really feel about it. Because that gets your partner to care. So your feeling might be, you know, I feel really sad, or I feel angry, or whatever is real for you. And your feeling is going to be different than mine, Zach, either some different feeling or more or less intense, right? And when you send this three-part message, which we call an XYZ message, the non-blameful description of the behavior, the concrete, tangible impact on you and your feelings about that impact. And you haven't been blameful, so your partner is not so likely to be defensive. Uh, so you're not going to have to deal with a lot of resistance, And but you will probably hear something like, oh, golly, I, I had a migraine last night and I just, I just couldn't do it. And I feel really bad that I let you down. I mean, you'll hear something like that probably. And I'll, I'll clean up right now. I'm really sorry. You know, whatever. They'll initiate behavior change much more likely to than if you had come on strong with a very blameful message. Mm. Goes back to expressing our feelings honestly and without judgment. Mm-hmm. I love that phrase. Non-blameful description, too. You may need to <laughs> write it out. I've written out a lot of XYZ messages in my life. Because it's hard to sometimes put it together in the heat of the moment. You you just come down for breakfast and the kitchen's a mess. You know, you're upset. What a crappy way to start the day. You know, you're upset. And so you may not be in good shape to say, honey, <laughs> whatever, and start with an XYZ message. So write it out and say, honey, I want to talk to you about something I'm upset about. And give them a little warning. And then say, you know, when you say you're going to do the the dishes and I come down for breakfast and they're not done, I can't find space to make my own breakfast. And I just feel so frustrated and disappointed and upset about the whole thing. And then be open to listening to their resistance because this person who's your partner is not out to ruin your life. This is not what they're trying to do. They just had their own reasons for why they didn't do the dishes, right? So you need to be willing to shift gears and power listen, whatever it is they say, and hear that this was a person that for some reason or another just couldn't do what they said they were going to do. Try to hear that with empathy and acceptance. And then after they've calmed down and not so defensive, say, well, you know, it's still kind of crappy for me when I come down for breakfast and last night's dishes is still there and there's not much room for me to make breakfast. I just, I hate it. And maybe the second time you say it, um, your partner will say, oh, I'm sure I, I'm sure it was horrible for you and I'm really sorry. I'll clean it up right now or, or whatever. You know, you'll get the behavior change you want. You may need to shift back and forth to the power listening a, a, a third time, a second or third time. That's what we call the confrontation cycle, and we talk about it in the book. And it's really helpful to know that confrontation is sometimes a process of confronting and then power listening and then confronting again and power listening until you're both calm enough to be able to talk about it and problem solve it in a normal kind of way. It's a skill. You can do it. It's not that tough. 
but you need to get good enough so that um, in the heat of the moment when when you have a conflict with somebody and you're one or both of you have emotion, an emotion that's running kind of high, the, the skill will come through and be there for you. Mm-hmm. So your partner is not out there to ruin your life. <laughs> no, <laughs> contrary to what you might think at the moment. <laughs> I know, but that's, it reminds me that, you know, growth is hard. We often don't, you know, we don't want to see our, our blind spots or our shadow side or, or to know the work that we have to do. But our partner is there to support us through it, which can be so helpful. Really, and your partner just had something come along in his or her life that got in the way, you know, and they're in their own defensive way, they're trying to tell you they feel bad about letting you down, if you can hear that. Well, thank you so much, Patty. You're just a fountain of awesome wisdom and knowledge about relationships. I have so many pages of notes. So thank you so much for coming on to the show. I want to end by asking a question I love to ask all of my guests, which is quite simply, what do you wish everyone knew about love? That if you use your listening skill regularly, you'll find it's more abundant than you ever realized. It's true. Wonderful. What's such a wonderful sentiment. Thanks again for coming on to the show. For our listeners who want to learn more about you and your nonprofit, how can they find you? And do you have any offerings or things you want our listeners to know about? You can find World Class Marriage at uh, Amazon.com. And you can get more information about the programs that we offer through Healthy Relationships California at www.relationshipsca. Stands for California.org. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patty Howell, for coming on to the show, sharing us your wisdom. And thank you, listeners, for listening to the show. We have so many concepts that we can bring into our relationship. Just a small list is to, one, avoid blame, two, practice empathic listening, three, give apology and forgiveness, four, being able to resolve conflicts, And of course, to bring empathy, acceptance, and genuineness into your relationships to fuel the growth that will help you conquer and meet any challenges that life throws at you. Thanks again for listening. If you want to learn more about me, you can go to ZachBeach.com and learn more about the show at TheHeartCenter.com. Thanks again, Patty. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to ZachBeach.com or TheHeartCenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 